So hi everyone, this is Nina Collins from Hello Revel. And I'm here today with Sarah Chadwick, author of The Sweetness of Venus, A History of the Clitoris. And Sarah was recently a guest at one of our Monday night sex chats and she was super popular. Um, and in that conversation, she shared a bit of this presentation, this kind of 20 minute presentation she's done for the book. And I thought it was so interesting that I wanted to invite her onto the podcast and go through it kind of without lots of women interrupting and asking questions. I'll be the only one here interrupting and asking questions. So welcome, Sarah, thank you for joining us. Hi, Nina, thank you for having me back. And it just made me so happy that Wolfers and Revelers were enthusiastic about the talk because when I was writing the book and researching it, I was torn between thinking, of course women are going to be interested, it's about the clitoris. I'm still just wondering if I was in my own little weird echo chamber, just me and clit, <laughs> and that maybe no one else much cared much. <laughs> Uh, um, no, and, everyone uh, cared. Everyone thought yeah. it was fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> do you know what? In the, in the writing and publishing journey, I did come across a, a lot of people who told me that the topic was niche. Um, like 50% of the population don't have one. Uh, right. 50, like our penises, our penises niche? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and... And like all of the many 40% of people with penises want to be or actually should be engaging with them. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, so before you start with, with your talk, I'm just, I'd love to know just how did you even come to this subject? Why did you write this book? The, the, the real trigger for the book was my 20 year old daughter coming to me and saying, mom, can I ask you a question? How does sex really work? Uh, which which I thought was was pretty amazing. And I realized that uh, although I had considered myself a liberal mother and I had given her labels for her genital anatomy, I hadn't really talked about female desire and pleasure and masturbation. So we mm. talked about those, uh, we, we talked about vibrators, uh, but it also set me off thinking about why, why when I'm so sex positive and I've given her the labels, why haven't I had these conversations? And, and she was then very open about what her friend group knew and were talking about. And I realized that, that today's young women are, are no better informed and are in power have been worse served by sex education and pornography and media presentation of what what sex what pleasurable sex looks like than actually our generation mm. um, and and I I was looking for a non-fiction idea for a book uh, and I I knew in my I had that I wanted to write a book that would appeal and speak to women and and once I started researching this I realized there was there was so much fascinating history and that it was something that that, that I felt very strongly about so yeah and you do it in a nice way I mean the book is really a mixture of humor and research so all right so tell us about it the sweetness of Venus a history of the clitoris by Sarah Chadwick yeah well as I said I wanted to get under the skin of why the clitoris was which is responsible for so much female desire and pleasure had been so marginalized. And, and I felt that understanding the history of the clitoris uh, and attitudes to female sexuality would enable people to challenge today's narrative, that if they know where it had come from, that, that they would be able to kind of shout, fooey, you know, that, that, that we know that's not true anymore, and that it would empower women to be able to speak about desire and pleasure and ask for, for what they wanted. But, but because of, uh, I guess, my background and the kind of person I am, which is I always like to have access to all of the information before I kind of talk about it. I went back to the very beginning and thought, OK, what is what is the what is the history of the clitoris? What is the history of anatomy? When did people discover it and, and what did people know about it? Uh, and, and this is. I mean, I found this is the book, it has the history of anatomy, but actually also has six sections on kind of art and culture and, and how it's manifested today. And that I found played into my background in education, in academia, in, in, in literature, uh, but the history of the, the, the anatomy, I didn't know. And, and then I just found it fascinating the way that actually it had been erased. 
Um, so, I, I mean, I didn't know until I started researching this book that the full anatomical structure of the clitoris looked like this. I mean, that yeah, was I've seen that. What Sarah's holding in her hands for anyone listening to us and not watching is this gold model of the clitoris, which you've probably seen has been become a little bit more popularized, I'd say, in the last few years. And it shows how deep interior uh interiorly is that a word how deep inside us the clitoris goes how deep the roots are that's probably not the right word either why don't you tell us a little bit about it sarah i, I was going to say that the clitoris in fact is very beautiful it looks a bit like an orchid maybe or a dragonfly uh and it extends within the pelvic cavity by seven to nine centimeters um, and, and one of the things I love learning about it is that during, during arousal that it fills with eight to 11 times its blood flow and the vagina fills with three to four. So in, in terms of kind of the power for, for desire and pleasure within the genital region, that it, it really does sit with the clitoris. Um, and I think that explains so much once you understand the anatomy uh, about how how pleasure works for women and you know it, the positioning in the cavity how aroused it is explains so much about what women experience well what do you um, mean by that what do you mean by that exactly uh well so if the 75 percent of women do not experience orgasm with penetration and okay. Because the studies vary, sometimes it comes back as 17%, sometimes it's 27%, but it's always under 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then the narrative I think that we've grown up with in the West is, is penetration is the sex actor. And I think when you understand the structure of the clitoris, you understand that if it's positioned within your pelvic anatomy so that the vagina is in close contact with the bulbs, then then you will experience orgasm mm -hmm. in, through penetration. But for many, many women, that's just not the case. It's not where it's uh, yeah. yeah, and, and it also explains the, I was really lucky to talk to Dr. Beverly Whipple, who wrote a lot in the 1980s about the G-spot, but has subsequently written about uh, female sexual orgasm, the or, female orgasm and, and continued to research it. And she said, it's the clitoris, the bulbs of the clitoris that make up along with the urethral sponge what in the 1980s we were calling the g-spot and mm -hmm. you know for many many women it, it it's it's a hugely pleasurable spot but for some women some women struggle to find it and mm -hmm. it's not a specific anatomical spot it's a confluence of of the genital pelvic anatomy right got it interesting yeah um I think one of the starting places with, with understanding why historically the clitoris has been erased uh, is that actually early anatomical thinkers and scientists just didn't believe that women were inside out versions of men, slightly mm -hmm. inadequate ones, but very definitely inside out versions of men. So where men have penises, we have a hole and we're the, we're the inverse of that, or we're inside out. Yeah, exactly. And, and Galen, who was the really big thinker with this, and, and I'll read a little bit from it. I mean, this was 130 AD, but, but it was still being used as the benchmark for thinking about women's bodies in the Renaissance. And he said, I mean, it's like origami instructions, turn out with the woman's, turn inward, so to speak, and fold double the man's, and you will find the same in, uh, you will find the same in both in every respect. You could not find a single male part left over that had not simply changed position. So for those of you listening, I've got a picture here of a Renaissance drawing by the influential anatomist Vesalius of, I mean, it looks like a penis, but in mm -hmm. fact, it's a disembodied vagina. And, and if you take a penis inside out and imagine that that's how the vagina is constructed, that explains this drawing. But this drawing uh, is crazy because it's, it really is a penis tip at the bottom. We don't have anything in us that looks like a penis tip. No, we don't, but it's this idea that women, it was this idea that, that women were inside out men and everything mm -hmm. had to have a parallel structure. Mm -hmm. So it and just had to, it had to work. 
this and, way. And so, so I think it was a matter of almost thinking, forcing the science. Yeah. And indeed, the coyness of looking at real anatomy, at real anatomy, uh, inhibited scientific research. But also this sort of narrative about how bodies worked was so dominant and so ingrained um, that it didn't get challenged. But it also means if this is how you think about male and female bodies, then I mean, the clitoris, there is no role for the clitoris because there doesn't have a parallel. If the definitive body is male and women are inadequate inside out versions, then the clitoris becomes an anomaly or, or it's like that bit that you get left over when you've constructed a set of Ikea shelves, shelves you, know, <laughs> right. kind of, you know, what do I, <laughs> um, and, and I think that explains then so much of the history, um, you know, this, this was foundational thinking. Yeah, this was uh, the way it was. Yeah, and, and there were, there were people, there were scientists who, who, who were talking about a site of female pleasure and, uh, called it clitoris but made references to to they had other words for it but they were not the dominant voices and they were always silenced by these dominant voices who who had this narrative mm -hmm. um and and these drawings were being replicated uh all the way through until in the 1800s mm -hmm. wow okay um, so we we were just inside out men yeah, and and you know, I've I've got a cartoon here that I I made, which is women according to men version one point zero, which is if that's if that's your model of bodies, then that reinforces intercourse as not only the sexual reproductive act but also the the pleasurable act, because if right. you imagine that a vagina is an inside out penis, you might imagine. That the pleasure experienced by a penis is when they sit exactly together. Yeah. 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 What works for A works for B. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, I I loved finding this quote. So so in 1559, Rialdo Colombo kind of challenged this dominant thinking uh, and stated the obvious, pointed out the obvious, and he discovered uh, the clitoris. Uh, and I'll read the quote for the podcast listeners. And this, dearest reader, is the principal seat of women's enjoyment in intercourse. If it is permissible to give a name to things discovered by me, it should be called the love or sweetness of Venus. Uh, and, and you can see now that's why I have called my book The Sweetness of Venus, The History of the Clitoris. Um, I mean, Rialdo Colombo said it was remarkable it hadn't been detected before, but also just look at the loveliness of that language, the sweetness of Venus. I mean, how have we, how have we lost that? It uh, makes sense that it wasn't detected before. Women had them. I, how could people have not detected it? Doctors, lovers, scientists. I mean, well, it, exactly here. like kind of duh. <laughs> right. Hello. <laughs> what what were women What were women doing? Um, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't acknowledged. It wasn't anatomically validated. I suppose. Well, and I do ex explore this in my book of this kind of cult counterculture that one has of what is an ex what is the dominant political view, if you like, and 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 then what's happening in secret, and and I think also who knew what was happening between couples and who knew what information was being passed. You know, it, I think it's rather like, you know, between women and daughters and their friends, you know, some people talk a lot about sex and, and will have, um, you know, will be fully alert to it. But indeed, there are many, many women today who yeah. still admit that it took them a long time to discover the clitoris, that they, they weren't given a label for it, that sex was taboo, that they, they didn't start playing with it or responding to it or working out how to masturbate and have an or experience orgasm until and into their 20s yeah no it's very true it's very true yeah fascinating all right uh, so Rialdo Colombo discovers the clitoris in 1559 then uh, what? But, but very quickly silenced uh by the dominant thinkers again and Vesalius back to the 
drawings frame, who was the big name of the day, he said, this is some sport of nature you have observed in some women. You can hardly ascribe this new and useless part as if it were an organ to healthy women. So again, this idea that a clitoris, that it's that it's an anomaly, that, that it's not healthy. Um, Shaming women. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think that explains uh, so much about, you know, did you know that the, the clitoris was considered by in the time of the witch hunts in the 16th century, that, that having a clitoris was considered to be a, a sign that you were cavorting with the devil, it was called the witch's teat. And I found um, records written at the time of the witch trials, um, where there had been strip body searches of witches to to find the teeth through which the devil had had sucked their oh soul. my god that is like the ultimate like shaming of female bodies it's really incredible yeah i, I if mean you have a clitoris you're a witch <laughs> <laughs> i mean having a clitoris was a dangerous thing and 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 so you we got, all have them. <laughs> you've got this dominant narrative going on and, and then you can see how you can see how women were scared and silenced and shamed. Yeah. And and if it was rich trials, and I talk about this in my book, then it was Freud uh, in in the early kind of 1900s who was also shaming clitoral mm -hmm. desire and pleasure. And and I, I talk about this in a section on psychology in my book. So you know, Freud argued that that an orgasm experience through the clitoris was immature and that a kind of fully functional adult woman would, should experience vaginal orgasm. So if you weren't being hounded for the fact that you had a clitoris and might be in cahoots with the devil, then you were being sent to a therapist chair. Um, you weren't having the right kind of orgasm. Because you were, uh, you were <laughs> immature and dysfunctional and you weren't having the right. So, so and I mean, Freud was still talking about this in 1933. You're so is it any, to think this. Is it any wonder our great grandmothers didn't talk about sex? Right, right, absolutely. And and that idea was still being replayed in some sex manuals in, in the 1960s and 70s. Even when you'd got Shea Height with her phenomenal research saying from a survey of 3,000 women where where... I found this, uh, so she, I think she asked about 50, I think it was 59 questions, only five mentioned the clitoris, but in response to so many questions, women wrote about the clitoris. Mm. You know, how do you achieve pleasure? What do you wish you experienced more of? I mean, they, they just kept bringing it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, she was she was hounded by by again the dominant thinkers of the day who didn't like the narrative and marginalized her work and Playboy branded it the hate report instead of the hype report. And oh, you know, wow, Harvard, I didn't know that. That's awful. Yeah, the Harvard Crimson newspaper kind of um what's it called when you um you know threw a whole load of doubt over her research methods and um completely damned damned the undermined work her. And, undermined her and mocked her <laughs> yeah 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 um uh, so and in fact um Sorry, I've lost my way a little bit in the present. Okay, we were talking about how so the clitoris was found and then it was basically debunked. Um, yeah, and then it was found again. Then it was found. <laughs> of course. <But> this <laughs> is the history of the clitoris, kind of. Yeah, in terms hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of years, basically. But a, a hundred years later, I mean, so so you know, it was lost and found in 1559. And then a hundred years later, Rainier de Graff was another surprise scientist laying claim to discovering the clitoris. Uh, he also gave uh, an account of the bulbs. So, so this idea that, you know, that the, the full structure of the clitoris has been known for so long. Um, Let me ask you a question. So now in 2021, do you feel like it has really changed? I mean, I I think I think I would say it has. I think the clitoris is now acknowledged. I mean, the orgasm gap is real and there are still men who don't focus on it or don't know what to do with it or maybe don't want to think about it. But I think it's now, wouldn't you say it's now in kind of public discourse acknowledged that it's important? 
I I think we live in a I, th I think we're in a we're in various sex positive communities and we True, good point and uh, we're very comfortable with it and therefore we bring the topic up but I, I had many many girlfriends and it was only when I started writing the book that I actually then found people were very quick and wanted to talk about sex but we hadn't talked about it before um, I I think we all think we know about the structure of the clitoris, but it's it's not in sex ed books for teens today. It's not in anatomy. It's not in high school anatomy and biology books. Uh, we know that sex ed in America uh, doesn't have a focus on pleasure. I, I find when I try and get publicity for the book that people completely bulk and kind of some people pale when I say it's a history of the clitoris. Mm. And I say there are no graphic images. It's a genuine history. I and, love and the section of the book, by the way, which we excerpted about the clitoral representation in art. I found that super fascinating. And you're right. When you think about sexual education, it's usually the picture of the fallopian tubes and the ovaries and the vagina. It's not about sexual pleasure. It's about how babies are made. We do. And, and in sex ed, you get those two diagrams. You get that kind of one I call the ram's head diagram with the kind mm -hmm. of uterus and the fallopian tubes. And then all the other one you get is the kind of concentric circles where, where you know, you know, you spread your legs and, and you've got, you have the circle of kind of the pudenda, the, the labia, the vagina, right. and, and the clitoris is usually indicated as a, as a tiny dot. Right. And, and, I talk about this in my book. I, I, my daughter and I went to Barnes and Noble and said, we thought we'd just do as part of the research for a book, a trawl of all of the kind of sex ed books for, you know, young kids all the way through to teens. And, and the woman very proudly gave us two books and said, these, these are new and updated in 2017 and they're our best selling sex ed books. And, and there was a pink book for the period book for girls. And, and what was the book for boys called? Uh, uh, what's going on down there was the boys book mm -hmm. and, and and the disparity between the two is extraordinary so so the boys book is all about you will be looking forward to sex you look in the index they get I mean they get sexual pleasure sex play STIs it talks about how the penis would fit with inside the vagina they get orgasm they get masturbation it's all there mm -hmm. and then the girls book the clitoris is is mentioned as as a small blump uh, responsible for tingly feelings there isn't no, a, really yeah there isn't a orgasm is not mentioned in the book once and is not in the index masturbation is not mentioned once and is not so these are books for teenage girls not women at least these are for like young girls well, they are that they, they are both designed. I mean, it's still shocking. Yeah, no, it's they're both designed shocking. for uh, for people hitting puberty. Yeah, yeah. And and I think we're naive if if we think that many fourteen and fifteen year olds are not experimenting and interested in sex. Oh, of course. And and I think also if by this time you don't have labels for the vulva and the clitoris, it becomes increasingly difficult to, and, and you're already setting them all up with an expectation. So the boys read their book and they're like, well, hey, whoopee, I can't wait for this. It's going to be so much fun. Right. And the girls are told well, instead that they will get romantic feelings. Well, think about the disastrous high school and college relationships where the girls are looking for you know they've got these unexplained tingly romantic feelings if if nobody has talked to them about the clitoris and desire and pleasure and how sex works then they're looking to kind of mimic maybe the sex that they see on tv or in porn right. yeah. and and the guys are just rearing to go thinking well this is how it works for me and it's going to be great and they yeah. have i mean the disservice done to i mean i really believe that most men want their partners to be having as much fun as them but oh absolutely i completely agree i think they just don't they just don't get it or they don't know well, they but, been... but they have been fed for general they have been fed it runs so deep this idea yeah. that you know the penis is the genius you know and so you get guys you, i mean i heard my daughter um i had a my daughter painted on our back deck uh, it, it's a trompe d'oeil and it looks like a rug and she's very neatly 
woven into it and hidden a clitoris motif. And <laughs> I overheard the whole, family, the whole family's in on this. Yeah, yeah. I overheard her kind of three o'clock in the morning with a group of, you know, probably a group of frat guys. They were clearly the other side of a bottle of vodka. And I heard her explaining that, that you know, what is this? And she was explaining the clitoris and how it works. And, and I kept hearing these guys, it, you know, it was drifting up to me through my open window in the summer air. These guys saying, but not with my dick, but not with my dick. And, um, you know, and, and my daughter kept saying, you're not listening. Right. Um, and, and I think they just, you know, the narratives they have been fed through media through pornography through all the art that they see where the, the penis is so visible no, it's totally true it's the patriarchy I mean it just is it's they've the, never been asked yeah to question it. I mean I spoke to her the following morning and was over breakfast and coffee laughing with her uh, and, and I said you know how did that go and she said well and needless to say none of them passed the first round interview <laughs> <laughs> good for her good for her well, Sarah, this is so interesting. Um, when did the book come out this summer? Uh, so the book came out rather sweetly on February the 14th in, in North America. So it's it's available uh, in and uh, America, anywhere that you would buy books. There's a fantastic audiobook read by um, the queen of audiobooks, Esther Bain, and uh, that's on any anywhere where we, you would listen to audiobooks. And, and in the rest of the world, it's available on Amazon. Great. And what's your Instagram? How can people find you on Instagram? So my Instagram is at its period personal girls. Um, I, I think in the UK, we use girls interchangeably with the way that in America, you would use them word ladies mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I I I didn't know that so so you know in hindsight I should have called it it's personal ladies instead of it's personal girls but, but that's I never mind now. I never mind the use of girls but of course some people do get annoyed but I use girls and ladies and anyway it's 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 period personal girls is yeah. the Instagram and the book is called the sweetness of Venus a history of the clitoris by Sarah Chadwick and I'm very happy to talk to you again. I think you've written a really important book and you've written it in a kind of funny, well-researched way and um, <laughs> lose it again and I'll kill you. That's hilarious. Yeah, the whole, the whole story of the, like, it gets found and gets lost and gets found and gets lost over and over again is super interesting. I hope we're not having the same conversation in a hundred years and, you know, it's disappeared again. But um, Anyway, I thank you very much for what you've what you've written and created and what you, the conversation you're forcing um, as hard as it sometimes is for people, which seems crazy. But you're right. It was a good point that we live. You and I live in kind of very sex positive circles and worlds. And so we don't always see the reality of, um, you know, what's going on elsewhere. I, I did try to be really conscious of that in my book. And for, and for that reason, I, I have. You know, I don't make, I try not to make obvious or crass jokes. There are no, I mean, I wanted there to be nothing in this book that would, the most uncomfortable thing about this book is the fact that it has the, the word clitoris on the cover. Mm -hmm. And otherwise that I think there is, there is nothing in I mean, there is, there is information that is shocking um, the way that the clitoris has been treated, but, but actually it isn't a kind of shocking sex book. It is a book that is a cultural commentary and, and hopefully funny. <laughs> Um, it is funny. I thought I found it quite entertaining. So, um, all right. You. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. We really enjoyed it. And it's a great book for wolfers and revelers. And it's really kind of perfect for our audience. So thanks again. And I wish you the best of luck with it.